uh, approach towards thyroid nodule assessment. Uh, some of the things stay the same, some of the things are new. Next. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the objectives of today's talk, uh, we would review the initial evaluation of thyroid nodules. Then we would look at the role of thyroid ultrasound and we would see what are the high risk and the low risk features on the ultrasound. Uh, we would review American Thyroid Association or ATA guidelines from 2015. And also one of the new developments is that American College of Radiology, ACR, came up with Thyroid Imaging Reporting and Data System or Thyreds, which is a system which helps us decide which nodules should be biopsied and which nodules can be followed radiologically. And at the end, we would look at the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology after FNA. Now, thyroid nodules, how do we find thyroid nodules in a patient? Uh, so either the patient or a family member would notice that there is some growth in the neck or during a clinical examination. Now, unfortunately, uh, Khawaja Azeem Saab sitting is sitting here. Back in the good days, physical examination was the cornerstone of clinical medicine. Unfortunately, now we are just looking at the labs and just, you know, writing the prescription. So the role of physical examination, especially for the medical students or the residents in training is role of physical examination is important because if you're not going to examine the neck, thyroid nodules can be missed and they would only come to clinical attention when they are really enlarged. The third way to uh, find the thyroid nodules is we are doing a lot of imaging now. So a patient goes for a PET scan, CT of the neck or chest or goes for a carotid Doppler and they find that there is some kind of nodularity on the ultrasound. Now the question is why are we talking about thyroid nodules? What is their importance? So the clinical importance of thyroid nodules is that we want to rule out cancer. Luckily thyroid cancer is still not very common. In a non-surgical series, 4 to 6.5% uh, of all nodules are cancers. So when a patient comes to me and has a thyroid nodule and is really anxious, could this be cancer? I tell them that 90 to 95% of these nodules are benign. So a large number of these would be benign and only 5 to 10% are cancer. So this is a statistic to just keep in mind to reassure the patients. Now, what are the causes? This is a slide from up to date. Uh, we can divide the causes of thyroid nodules into benign and malignant. In the benign category, we have the multinodular goiter, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is a very common condition. Then we can have cyst. Cyst can be colloid, simple or hemorrhagic. Then we have follicular adenomas, which can be macrofollicular or microfollicular. There is a new entity called NIFTP. This used to be thought of as cancer in the past. So this is something that is reported on pathology. This is non-invasive follicular tumor with papillary-like nuclear features. So we have now found that this is a benign category. These patients do not need radioactive ablation after surgery. Then we have herthal cell adenomas, which can again be macrofollicular or microfollicular. On the other side, we have the malignant causes of thyroid nodules. The most common thyroid cancer is the papillary thyroid cancer, followed by follicular cancer, which can be minimally or widely invasive, and its other subtypes are oxyphilic, and then non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features. This is a malignant variant. And then we have the rare causes of thyroid cancer or nodules. Medullary thyroid cancer is very less common, typically seen with MEN syndromes. Then we have the anaplastic cancer, which has a very high mortality. Or rarely, we can have metastatic cancer to the thyroid from breast, renal cell cancer, or other cancers. Now, the first uh, part of uh, thyroid nodule evaluation, again, as I said, is history and physical examination. Like any good clinician, your first tool is a good history and examination. Then the next step would be to check their TSH level. And the third is to do a thyroid ultrasound. So we will look at all these in a little detail. On history, what you are trying to find out is, are there any high risk features in the history which points towards the possibility of thyroid cancer? So the first is history of rapid growth of a neck mass. So you should ask the patient that have you noticed that in the last six months, this nodule or growth is getting bigger or not. Then if there is any childhood head and neck radiation history. Now this has become less common now. Back in the old days, they used to do a lot of radiation for different causes and that would lead to increased risk of uh, thyroid cancer, any total body irradiation for bone marrow transplantation, or if there is family history of thyroid cancer, that also increases the risk of cancer. So we should ask in the history about that. Or there are certain thyroid cancer syndrome, like I mentioned, MEN2, in which patients can have medullary thyroid cancer. And then we have something called familial 
adenomatous polyposis or Countdown syndrome, these patients also have increased risk of thyroid cancer. On physical examination, you are looking for a fixed hard mass. If the mass is fixed and hard, that is more high risk feature. If there is cervical lymphadenopathy, again, the importance of examination. And if when you're talking to the patient, there is hoarseness of the voice that can point towards vocal cord paralysis, again, a high risk feature. The next step, and this can be asked in boards and even in your uh, uh, you know, professional examination is that what is the first test to order in the blood after you get you know, imaging done? So it should always be a TSH level. And why the TSH is important? If the TSH is suppressed or low, that would mean that the patient has either subclinical or clinical hyperthyroidism. The, and that means that the nodule that the patient have is hyperfunctioning. And hyperfunctioning or hot nodules are almost never cancerous. So you then you don't have to worry about doing a biopsy and all those things. A lot of time what happens is patient has a nodule and they get the biopsy and then they get the blood work done. If you do a biopsy on a hot nodule, a lot of time it comes back as follicular neoplasm and then you are confused. So TSA should always be the first test. Now this is a scheme from up to date. It's a little small in print, but basically it mentioned the same thing. That first step is to get a TSH and ultrasound. If the TSH is low, then you treat it as hyperthyroidism. If the TSH is normal or high, then you would look at the ultrasound. Now, thyroid ultrasound is the cornerstone of uh, management of thyroid nodules. And it should be done in every patient. So if a patient find, is found to have a nodule on a PET scan or a CT scan, your first step should be an ultrasound because when it comes to thyroid, thyroid ultrasound gives us the most information. And with the ultrasound, you would see if there are any other nodules present or if there's any lymphadenopathy. And a good ultrasound report, again, ultrasound is user dependent study. A good ultrasound report should mention about the composition of the nodule, its echogenicity, shape of the nodule, and how are the margins of the nodules, and if there's any presence of echogenic foci. Now, this is how a thyroid ultrasound looks like. Uh, so you can see uh, this is the subcutaneous tissue uh, followed by uh, strap muscles. This is the right lobe of the thyroid, then this is the isthmus, left lobe of the thyroid, then laterally you have the common carotid artery, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, in internal jugular vein, and this, then this is the longest coli muscle, which sometimes can look like a thyroid nodule, so it's important to know about the anatomy. On the left side, we have the esophagus, which is more towards the left side, and then the same marking. And you can see this is a nice looking thyroid, very homogeneous. Now, we see these terms a lot, especially again, for the residents, whenever you get a report on a thyroid nodule, it would mention that the nodule is either hyperechoic, hypoechoic, isoechoic. So I just wanted to show how it looks like. Hyperechoic means that the nodule is brighter than the surrounding thyroid tissue. That's how it would look like. Hypoechoic means that it would be darker than the surrounding tissue. Isoechoic means that you cannot differentiate the nodule much. The parenchyma looks like the same as the normal thyroid tissue. And at the end, you have a cystic nodule, which is anechoic, means there's no echogenicity. Now, what are the high risk and low risk features on a thyroid ultrasound? How do we know which nodule is more high risk and low risk? And it is important because that would help us decide which nodule should be biopsy. So the first thing is the echogenicity. So as I told you, uh, showed you in the previous slide. So the nodules which are more uh, hyperechoic, these are considered to be low risk nodules. And also the nodules which are isoechoic. Whereas if the nodule is hyperechoic, that's a high risk feature. So the first thing is echogenicity. The second is the composition of the nodule. If the nodule is solid, that would be considered to be a high risk feature. Whereas if the nodule is cystic, which means it's just filled with fluid, or if it is spongy form, I would show you what spongy form nodule looks like and what exactly it is. That would be a low risk nodule. Then presence of micro or macro calcifications, both are high risk features. Whereas if the, there is comet tail artifact, and I would show you how comet tail looks like. It looks like calcification, but it's more like elongated, looks like a tail. And then, you know, if there is X-shell calcification, if there is a, a calcification all around the nodule, if it is continuous, then it means it's a benign nodule. If it is interrupted, that would mean it's a high-risk feature. The next is presence of irregular margins. And if the nod nodule is taller than white, shape of the nodule. So these are all the high-risk features. Now, I would show you how some of these things look like. So this is a nodule which is hyperechoic. You can see that it is brighter than the surrounding and it has very nice smooth margins. So this looks like a benign nodule just based on its appearance. 
this is a simple cystic nodule you can see there is no solid component in the nodule again cystic nodules are very low risk nodules and most of the time you do not need to biopsy these nodules they are very low risk now this is what i was telling you this is a common tail sign so this is a colloid nodule and when you do the ultrasound when the ultrasound waves pass through the colloid material they leave this common tail kind of a, it looks like calcification but it is more elongated this is a very benign feature and these nodules again don't typically need to be biopsied now this is a spongiform nodule so this is also over the last as you had asked what has changed over 10 years we have uh, this term spongiform nodule has been used more in the recent guidelines this is a nodule where there are multiple micro cysts which are covering more than 50 percent of the volume of the nodule so you can see that these are small cysts throughout the nodule covering more than 50 percent this, these nodules are also very low risk nodules and unless they are very big you typically don't need to biopsy them. Now on the other hand so the nodules we have looked at so far were all uh, benign in appearance. Now this nodule if you look at it what do you think is the, is the I mean it's clear that it's hypoechoic. It's very dark as compared to the surrounding and you can see that the borders are irregular. So if you see this kind of a nodule most likely this would be cancerous nodule it needs to be biopsied and if it is abnormal then the patient would need surgery. And this nodule again is very high, uh, highly suspicious in appearance. It has both micro calcification and areas of macro calcifications. Again, this kind of a nodule would need a biopsy. Now, this is what we call X shell calcification, that the boundary of the nodule has a calcification. But in this patient, as you can see, that this is interrupted, that it is not all around the nodule. So, this would also be considered to be a high risk nodule. And typically these nodules need a biopsy although a practical point is these nodules are difficult to biopsy sometime because you have to pass through the calcification which sometimes can be more challenging now that we know what are the different high risk and low risk features how do we decide which nodule should be biopsied and which should be left alone so on this slide i have this is a summary of the american thyroid association ata guidelines from 2015 this year they are coming up with a new set of guidelines which would be published by the end of this year. So we would start from the bottom of the slide. At the bottom of the slide we have a cystic nodule. So as I was telling you cystic nodules are very benign in appearance and typically the risk of cancer in these nodules is less than 1%. Cystic nodules do not need to be biopsied except if the nodule is so big that the patient is having pressure symptoms. Sometimes you can just relieve the pressure by aspirating the cyst although the cyst would reform in the next few months. We have now newer techniques. There is ethanol ablation being done in US where you can just inject ethanol into the cystic nodule and that ablates it. So that is a very effective but that is still done at a very few centers. Otherwise surgery is an option in these patients as well. Then we have the next category which is very low suspicion. Now these are the nodules in which the risk of cancer is less than 3% and you can biopsy them if they are more than 2 centimeters. These nodules include the nodule that we just discussed which is called spongiform nodule or mixed solid cystic nodule. So these nodules you can biopsy as per the ATA guidelines. We will come to the ACR thyroid guidelines after this one, but only if they are more than 2 cm. Anything under 2 cm, no need to biopsy. Next is the category called low suspicion. This is where the risk of cancer is 5 to 10 percent. These nodules include, as I told you, that hyperechoic nodules are typically low risk nodules. So this would include hyperechoic and isoechoic nodules. You only biopsy them if they are more than 1.5 centimeters as per the ATA guidelines and the risk of cancer is 5 to 10 percent. The next two categories as we go up the risk goes up. So this is called intermediate suspicion which is the risk of cancer is 10 to 20 percent. This includes nodules which are hyper echoic but with smooth margins and on the top now for these nodules the, the cutoff for ATA is 1 centimeter. So any nodule which is solid and hyper echoic more than a centimeter you can biopsy and on the top we have very high risk for cancer these are the nodules which are hypoechoic with something additional uh, which is high risk like they can either have micro calcifications in this one or there is irregular margin in this one or the nodule shape it is taller than wide or if there is any presence of uh, lymphadenopathy so so this is what the ata guidelines look like so at the bottom you have the benign category and on the top this means that any nodule which is less than one centimeter in size as per the ATA guidelines, you do not need to biopsy those because even if they are cancerous, we know from the long term series that uh, tumors which are less than a centimeter hardly have poor prognosis. So you can observe those. Now this is called ACR thyroids 
classification. These days, when you order a thyroid ultrasound, even here, most of the hospitals now, when you get the radiology report, they would assign a thyroid score to the nodule. So, what thyroid is, basically, they look at five features of the nodule. Composition, echogenicity, shape, margins, and echogenic foci. And then they would assign a number to the nodule based on that. If the nodule is cystic, then there is zero point. Spongy form is zero point. If they are mixed solid cystic, one point. And if they are solid, then they give them two points. Next is the echogenicity. If they have no echogenicity, zero points. Hyperechoic is one point. Hypoechoic is two point. And they have a, another term, very hypoechoic, very dark looking nodules. They give them three points. Next is the shape. If the nodule is wider than tall, then zero points. Taller than wide is three points. And next is the margin. Again, if the margin is smooth, then zero points. Irregular margin has some points. Echogenic foci, no foci, zero points. Micro classification gets three points. So after you calculate these points, then you uh, come up with these five different categories. Uh, TR1 is zero points. So this is a benign nodule, no need for biopsy. TR2 has two points. Again, these are benign, no need for biopsy. For TR3 to TR5, they have different cutoffs based on the size. If there are three points, then it's TR3. You biopsy them if the nodule is more than 2.5 centimeter. TR4, you biopsy if it's more than 1.5 centimeter. And TR5, you biopsy if it's more than 1 centimeter. Now, this slide compares these two guidelines. As I said, currently there are two guidelines which help us decide which nodule should be biopsied and which can be left alone. On the left, we have the ATA guidelines, and on the right, we have the ACR thyroid guideline and basically the main difference is between the intermediate category for benign category both the guidelines agree that you do not need to biopsy and for the high risk category both guidelines agree that these nodules should be biopsy but in the acr thyroid guideline they have a higher threshold to biopsy they say that do not biopsy a low risk nodule unless it's 2.5 centimeter whereas for ata guideline the cutoff was 1.5 centimeter so either one of these two guidelines can be used. Now, once you have decided that you are going to biopsy a certain nodule, the procedure for choice is FNA with ultrasound guidance. And uh, if there are multiple nodules, sometimes the patient will have two or three nodules, then you evaluate each nodule separately. So, you know, in the older days, we used to say only biopsy one nodule. That's not true. If the patient has two suspicious nodules, uh, biopsy both the nodules. And the last is core biopsy. Now, core biopsy used to be the standard of care in the past, but it's a very painful procedure. These days, it's done uh, in a very few number of cases, only if it's a cystic nodule, which has been non-diagnostic multiple times. Now, should we ever biopsy a nodule which is less than a centimeter in size? So, there are some exceptions. Less than 0.5 centimeter, technically, you cannot biopsy those nodules. Between 0.5 and 1 centimeter, we have sometimes biopsied those nodules if there is a strong family history of thyroid cancer, if the patient is young, if there is history of radiation to the neck, or if the patient just wants to have the FNA done, in those cases, you can consider doing a biopsy. Now, once we get the biopsy report, we, uh, we ask the pathologist mostly to follow the Bethesda classification. And on this classification, the biopsy would come as one of these six categories. On the top, we have the non-diagnostic category. That means that there were not enough cells. In this case, the biopsy should be repeated again. The second is a benign category. This means that there were no evidence of cancer in the uh, biopsy specimen. The risk of cancer is 0 to 3%. And these nodules can then be followed with an ultrasound in 6 to 24 months. Next is the two categories, 3 and 4. So the third category is atypia or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. And the fourth is follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. These are called in determinate categories that the risk of cancer is 5 to 15 percent and 15 to 30 percent and these two categories i know our next talk is on the role of molecular markers so now the new development in the last 10 years is previously for these two categories we used to just repeat the biopsy again and if it's still the same then we would do the surgery but you can see that the risk of cancer is only 30 percent in these patients which means that all the nodules that we were taking out all the thyroid 70 percent were still benign and I guess in Pakistan, we still have the same practice because we don't have molecular markers here yet. So what we do is, but unfortunately, most of the thyroid which would be removed for, from category 3 and 4 would come out to be benign. So patients do get unnecessary surgeries. And then we have the fifth and sixth categories, suspicious for malignancy and malignant. These two categories should go for surgery. So after you get the FNA report, uh, uh, it should be, we should encourage the pathologist 
Dr. Talit, is the pathology department here uh, mentioning the Bethesda classification? Yes, they do. They do. Okay, good, excellent. And this is what I have already mentioned. This slide uh, mentions what to do once you get the biopsy report back. <coughs> As I said, if it's non diagnostic, then you repeat it. If it is benign, now, uh, even if it is benign, we do at least do one more ultrasound in 6 to 24 months just to make sure that the nodule is not getting bigger because sometimes benign nodules also increase in size. And then I mentioned three and four should go for molecular testing and fifth and sixth should go for surgery. Now, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, approximately 25% of these nodules are indeterminate coming in Bethesda three or four categories. Before the introduction of molecular testing, majority of the patients with a cytological result showing ATP of undetermined significance used to go for surgery. But now we have at our institution in US, we use what uh, we call the Firma gene expression classifier. And this is a molecular diagnostic test with a high negative predictive value. So the way molecular testing helps is that they are great rule out tests because if they come back negative, that nodule is highly unlikely to be cancerous and surgery can be avoided. And I'll show you how the report looks like. So this is when we get the report back from a Firma molecular testing. This patient, it mentions, had a benign cytology on the molecular testing and the risk of cancer is less than 4%. So this patient, we would not send this patient for surgery. And as compared to that patient, uh, this report shows suspicious. This means that the risk of malignancy is 50%. Now, 50% means that half of these patients would still have benign uh, nodules, but the 50% risk of cancer is high enough that these patients are then sent for surgery. So we get either this benign report on the firma or we get suspicious. And based on that, now they are also checking certain genes. Like in this patient, it mentions positive BRAF. <clears throat> And that also helps us decide the extent of surgery because BRAF is associated with a high, highly uh, malignant cancer. So those patients would also get more, you know, uh, uh, surgery, uh, neck dissection, lateral neck dissection, and all those things. And if the BRAF is negative, then you can just limit to central lymph node dissection. So and also it helps us decide which patient should get uh, iodine therapy after surgery or not. So molecular testing, like you said, the precision you know, medicine is the medicine of future. So with molecular testing, we can really decide which nodules are going to metastasize in the future. So we need to be more aggressive with those and which nodules we can be less aggressive. So the take home points from today's uh, presentation is initial assessment of thyroid nodules include measuring the TSH and getting an ultrasound done. Hot or hyperfunctional nodules do not need FNA. If it's a non-functional thyroid nodule, they should get FNA as per ATA or thyroid criteria. Nodules not biopsy should be monitored by ultrasound in 6 to 24 months. Fine needle aspiration with ultrasound guidance is the gold standard for diagnostic evaluation of clinically relevant nodules. Cytopathology should be reported as per Bethesda classification. Further management of nodules is based on Bethesda category of the nodules. And finally, increasing role of molecular testing for Bethesda 3 and 4 categories. Uh, and in the next talk, we would know more about this molecular testing. Thank you. If any questions, I will be happy to answer. I wouldn't take the questions in the panel discussion. Okay, sure. We have time. Thank you.